many uh, diseases will actually induce mechanical changes. So you're familiar with sort of biological changes, which might be changes in expression of a particular protein. Uh, there may also be some mechanical changes that occur. And one of the examples that I, I really like uh, is the case of infection by uh, the plasmodium parasite, in the case of uh, malaria, where you can see uh, in this case that the malaria parasites have been stained, uh, within the red blood cells have been stained. And uh, other studies have shown that the mechanical properties of those red blood cells are drastically different. So they're much less compliant and will lead to uh, physiological chain, uh, effects. So, for example, uh, decreased blood flow in a patient, but also opens up uh, potential for new biomarkers. The other example is that cells during their normal processes may also change their mechanical properties. In this case, uh, one of the sort of classic studies is in the case of as cells differentiate into particular tissue types, say in the zincable stem cell, uh, they tend to uh, modify their mechanical properties as they come into contact with tissues with different mechanics. And, you're probably familiar that, that brain, for example, might have uh, it's much softer than bone. Uh, likewise, the cells associated with uh, those particular tissues may also undergo mechanical changes. So that opens up the possibility of being able to uh, differentiate or uh, purify based on mechanical properties of particular cell types. Uh, so we're trying to come up with some biomechanical uh, methods with which we can determine the biophysical properties of cells. And this uh, involves both measuring mechanical properties uh, and also potentially separating by those properties, akin to a, a flow cytometer. Uh, so one of the uh, sort of the traditional methods for measuring mechanical properties uh, utilizes uh, techniques such as described here. This is what's called an atomic force microscope. And it utilizes a very soft spring in the shape of this uh, cantilever structure. And you can measure the deflection of that soft spring uh, simply by bouncing the laser beam and watching uh, the laser beam move up and down in the CCD as the cantilever bends. So you can actually, our researchers actually use uh, techniques like this, using a soft spring to probe and perturb the mechanical properties of biological materials. So you can imagine taking this cantilever structure, uh, indenting a soft, squishy cell, for example, and because you know the spring constant, you can uh, determine how much you indent the cell to determine the spring constant. Or the, the, the stiffness of the cell. And we've actually uh, teamed up with uh, John McDonald here at Georgia Tech uh, to do this in order to, uh, to potentially determine whether a cell stiffness can be used as a biomarker in the case of uh, uh, can uh, the invasiveness of cancer. So John uh, studies ovarian cancer, uh, ovarian cancer. And so from his lab, uh, we've, we've measured and perturbed uh, uh, several different cell types associated with uh, both more healthy phenotypes as well as cancerous phenotypes. And this is a plot of the Young's modulus, which is a measure of the mechanics. Uh, and this is a, a bar and whisker plot. So this sort of gives you a sense of the spread of the mechanics of individual cells as well as the, the median stiffness. And you can see that in the case of ovarian epithelial cancers, uh, the cell stiffness uh, is uh, decreased in comparison to a more healthy phenotype. But what was particularly interesting to us is that uh, invasive phenotypes seem to be the softest of all. And in fact, if we correlate uh, the relative invasiveness of three different uh, ovarian cell types, this is a uh, metastatic uh, ovarian cell, this is a less metastatic, still cancerous, but less metastatic cancer uh, cell, as well as a healthy phenotype, you can see that there's this inverse relationship between the modulus, the end modulus, as well as the invasiveness potential. So that opens up this idea that not only can you potentially use this as a biomarker for technical cancer, but potentially you could use this as a way of discriminating a more invasive cancer from a uh, less invasive cancer. So the problem though with, AF, with AFM is that it's a quite slow technique. So this data that I just showed you here, um, one particular uh, cell type might take a full day. You know, this might be 50 data points. I might take a full, my graduate student a full day to take. So we're, we'd like to be able to use some micro, technolo micro technologies that can uh, measure uh, cell mechanics at a much higher throughput. And to do so, uh, one of my collaborators, Alex Alexi, and I came up with this concept of utilizing a deformability to translate cells into different directions. So this is a capsule that uh, Alex has simulated. 
undergoing compression in, this ridge, in these ridges. And the idea, though, is that these ridges are at an angle, so that when the cell, uh, when the particle first hits, it first translates along the ridge before the fluid then pushes it all the way through. Now, in simulation, you can then uh, measure the, the, the motion uh, of a softer particle, and you can see that it, it undergoes much less translation. So it just follows the fluid flow streams and squeezes right through the constriction. So the idea then is if you engineer this gap, the correct diameter, the correct uh, size, you may be able to induce translation as a function of mechanical property. And so what can we then do with that? So with that idea, we try to come up with a microfluidic solution to separate, to biophysical separation. The idea is that you have a mixture of cells, and these cells may have different mechanical structures. You send them through a microfluidics device that has these engineered ridges of its particular uh, gap size, and then we can get them to stiffer cells to follow the direction of the ridge toward the upper part of the channel and exit the top. Uh, whereas softer cells will then follow the flow, the flow streams and exit uh, to this bottom channel. And the idea then is that you can have, from this mixture, you can have a biophysical separation technique akin to a flow cytometer. Uh, and this is, a sort of, this is a demonstration of that concept where we send in a mixture of cells. Uh, these we've artificially softened using a, a chemical called static place ND. And then we also stain them fluorometrically so that we can uh, observe where, uh, how they go. And we see that uh, the stiffer cells will tend to uh, progress in the direction of the, uh, uh, of the ridges, and the softer cell will, uh, will go to the second outlet. And we can collect that at an enhanced concentration. So this is a, a high-speed microscopy image of a, a white blood cell called A562. And this first one is a, is a, uh, a relatively stiffer cell. This is about uh, this. We, we artificially soften these cells by adding a uh, side of place in D. And you can see that uh, at each ridge, the cell uh, pokes through, and it pauses a bit, and then it, but it's slowly traversing in the, so the upward direction. So cells that are uh, softer, so this is, these are softened with a, um, with a chemical, you can see that uh, they don't, they basically go straight through. Uh, this line sort of gives you the, the change in, in Y uh, as a function of about four or five ridges. And you can see that this cell uh, follows the streamlines and actually moves slightly downward. So if we amplify this mechanical in these trajectories by including uh, hundreds or thousands of ridges, uh, we, have this, we can then potentially separate uh, very subtle differences in mechanical surface. So these, I just wanted to point out that these are uh, much, these, these move much more quickly. It takes about, uh, about 100 microseconds for a cell to, to go from ridge to ridge, you just slow it down here so that we can follow the trajectory to more accurately. So what account, what, uh, we're also interested not just in the potential application of how, what kinds of cell types we can separate, we're also interested in understanding sort of the, the biophysical, um, having a biophysical understanding of what causes separation. So this is a plot of the energy it takes to compress a particle. So we can say a cell. And uh, this is where the ridge is. So initially it takes a very small amount of energy and the cell is under the, uh, under the ridge. It's fully compressed and the energy plateaus. So to understand what the forces are, we take the derivative of the energy. So basically uh, the, this ridge will tend to force the cell down the slope or forward the slope. And if we overlay the, uh, the force uh, with, the with the ridge, you can see that initially the particle is being driven by, uh, by viscous drag, so by the fluid. Uh, as the particle becomes compressed by uh, the ridge, there there's an additional force due to this compressive energy uh, perpendicular to the ridge. And then as the uh, cell exits the ridge, there's an equivalent, equivalent uh, uh, force that's also perpendicular to the ridge, and those forces will stop. So the net trajectory then Will be, will be following the, the, uh, the superposition of the forces. So what this says is uh, we expect a wiggle motion to the, first of all, it says we expect a wiggle motion to the, to the cells as it moves through. So there's going to be a net motion upward, but as the cell exits the ridge, we expect a net motion downward. 
And also, that wiggle should be proportional to the stiffness of the cell. And that's exactly uh, what we see in, in, as we follow these trajectories. So this is a high-speed uh, image of a single cell uh, following through the uh, being compressed and being translated. And you can see that the, uh, the motion is, has a much larger uh, amplitude than in the case of a softer cell. And these simulations show that we have a, a sort of basic understanding of what the actual physical mechanisms of separation are. So we've just started to uh, perform actual experiments in, in separation of two different cell types. So these are, uh, these are an epithelial cell called AAA and a uh, white blood cell called Jerkat cell lines. These are both cell lines. And they differ in mechanics by about a factor of four or so. So the, the AAA cells have a Young's module of about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 uh, kilopascal, whereas the Jerkat cells are about 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.2 kilopascal. And we send them in at, at a roughly equal ratio. So we fluorescently label them and analyze them using flow cytometry. And this is what we're giving as an input to the device. And you can see that there's this big population of hay, hay cells, big population of jerk head cells. And we mistakenly uh, included some double, double uh, labeled cells as well in, 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 the, uh, in the input. And then on the output, so the ridge is going in the sort of the upward northeast direction. We collect an enriched concentration of uh, the HAA cells in the top and an enriched concentration of the, um, of the jerk head cells in the bottom. So there's a lot of aspects to the separation that we're still trying to understand. Uh, things, for example, like variations in size will couple into what this biophysical, what we want to be biophysical. So we imagine that it might be potential to, to sort of integrate uh, multiple biophysical met separation methods into one device, so including size separation, potentially including stiffness separation, and potentially even <coughs> separation. This would be being able to separate from high throughput by piece of properties as well. Um, so, uh, sort of a summary of uh, where, where we're standing right now. Uh, so, it's a relatively simple system. We can drive it with our thumb, with a syringe in our thumb. We happen to use a syringe pump, but uh, it's relatively easy to operate. Uh, it, there's no required labeling. Uh, we happen to fluorescently label the cells just so we can analyze the results afterwards. Although the separation doesn't necessarily require any kind of, uh, any kind of external labeling. Uh, relatively cheap and simple to fabricate. Uh, we can make about um, roughly about 12 chips uh, in a batch process for time. And uh, it's relatively fast. So we can uh, analyze about uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 cells per second uh, currently. So our next steps is we're just st still understanding some of the biophysical properties. We're still uh, working with um, with cell with cell lines. Although uh, in, in the very near future we, we would like to start using some primary cells as well to test how they test how they work. And uh, let me just finish up with show you. Here's some of my students that work on it. Uh, Billy is my graduate student who worked on the microfluidic separation, and one way is one of my students who worked on the cell cancer cell mechanics. So we have to take any, any questions now. We get uh, maybe five to ten, mm -hmm. but if we're using two different cells mm -hmm. uh, with some range of differences in the mechanics. Uh, it's a little bit lower, about three to three to four. Right. So can you stream for all of these um, devices in series, and then I mean you can't get at the size problem if it's yeah. an inhomogeneous size population, but then if it is just the imperfection of the biomechanics, then you can probably overcome that by having multiple of the same device. Yeah, that's exactly. Continues to hear about. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we thought. It's a little more complicated than that, as we learned. Uh, so we initially, we, 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 what we first did was we looked at the trajectories. Mm -hmm. And we said, oh, okay, there's a difference in soft and stiff. So it just seems like if you just keep including more ridges, mm -hmm. you get more separation. Right. 
So we kept making our devices longer and longer, and it turned out that was the wrong, our separation purity was getting worse and worse. And it looks uh, that uh, as the cells become compressed multiple times, their overall mechanics seems to change. Uh, so they, they tend to become more pancakey, and they, and they tend to become effectively softer. So we found actually we are getting better results by using shorter, shorter devices. So only uh, about 30 ridges is sort of our sweet spot. So we're starting to go to, sh we're, we stopped going to bigger devices, we're going to sh shorter devices now. How long does it take for the uh, cell to go from the first to the 30th? I take what well, we've done. We've only, so far, we've only done one to a thousand. So it takes about a second to go through the whole, or a fraction of a second to go mm -hmm. through all thousand. So it's pretty. It's a very fast, mm -hmm. uh, very fast process. So you cannot be using no transactions or mechanical transactions, basically. I think it's a. Yeah, we don't think there's any. As far as we know, can assume there's no, you know, expression change. Mm -hmm. We think it's more of a bio, mechanical, biophysical effect that we're trying to. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. All right. What's your